Hi everybody, my name is Ali. I'm a grateful alcoholic. Glenn, thank you, brother, for your gracious invitation to you and the group. I uh, appreciate you guys. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, you know this, man, this uh, Zoom era has been such a blessing for me anyways. I mean, uh, I, I get to meet people that from all across the world and kinder spirits and, you know, people that are seekers just like me and people perhaps that that are newer that, that we could be of service to. It's, it's just been an amazing experience for me. Uh, my plate has become really, really full. It was full before, but even more so. Um, so I just want to uh, express my gratitude. One of the silver linings in this, uh, in these difficult times has been the fact that our community has come so much closer, right? And I get to interact and build relationships with people like Glenn, you know, people that walked this path much before me yet still exhibit a level of humility and kindness that I only strive to have, you know? So thank you, brother, for, for everything that you do as well in your invitation. Um, I, uh, I always want to make sure to remember to thank the long timers and the old timers, people like Glenn and others on this, on this call, uh, because, because I was one of those retreads, they call them, I think. <laughs> I was in and out for seven years dying in this program, you know? Uh, I just couldn't get it, couldn't get it. And it was the... Uh, there was a long time and the old timer as the elder states person, let's say, that, that would, uh, that, you know, with, with your kindness, with your humility, you kept on telling me, keep coming back, kid, and put your hand on my shoulder. It's going to be all right. You exhibited um, and you practiced these 12 steps in such a way that the program became attractive to me. You know, you walked these steps and you still do. So I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for being here. Um, I want to let you know that I'm not here to teach anybody anything or to tell you what to do. <laughs> I may get passionate, but just please don't mistake. That's just my passion. That's all that is if it comes out, right? Um, because uh, my entire life has been peppered with resurgence, the ego and fumbling and stumbling, and I've surely done that in recovery. I haven't walked the perfect path, you know? Uh, it's been my experience that, that, that these wounds that I continue to have, these, this brokenness that I continue to have gives my life a deep set level of... Uh, deep sense of meaning and purpose because see what I get to do is this robe in front of you and a newcomer spiritually speaking and allow people to see the wounds and allow people to see the light of this powerful forgiving loving God shine through them that's what we do for each other you know what I mean there's a big book say there's a line in the big book that I, it says uh, we are some paraphrasing we are sure God wants our heads in the clouds with him but our feet right here on earth planted on earth because that's where our fellow travelers live, right? So that's what makes us useful to each other. I'm always going to share from my brokenness, <laughs> hopefully. And that's a very spiritual, uh, spiritually powerful tool that we have, right? Um, so, okay, that's enough of that. <laughs> um, it's the last, little, the last few times that, that, I, that I've been asked, I've been given the honor of sharing uh, in this way. It just comes to me. So this has been coming to me, so I need to share this again. Uh, periodically, I, I, um, I, I ponder and I meditate and I contemplate on, I think about uh, the beginnings of Alcoholics Anonymous, about decades before the actual inception of Alcoholics Anonymous. For those friends that are new or newly coming back, the psychiatrist, the, the, the famous psychiatrist, Dr. Carl Gustav Jung, <laughs> he was the contemporary of Freud. Everyone knows Freud, not many people know Jung, not as many, right? Same, same level. His books are studied to this day in people that are doing their doctorate in psychology and medical schools and stuff like that. This guy's a big deal, very intelligent guy. And he was a very spiritual man. And he sort of, in some ways, uh, ignited the spark of spirituality that decades down the road led to the inception of Alcoholics Anonymous, right? Uh, so Bill Wilson, 15 years after the inception of AA, writes some letters to Dr. Young. And, uh, and again, I'm paraphrasing. You can Google these letters on the internet. Now everything's on the internet, right? It, basically, I'm paraphrasing. He's thanking him. He thanked him for, for what he did for Alcoholics Anonymous decades before Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, Carl Jung writes back, and, and he writes something like this, that from his experience, alcoholics, are, because he tried to help hopeless alcoholics for years, the alcoholics of our hopeless variety have always been seeking a relationship with God. Been seeking a relationship with love, a yearning sense of belonging, understanding, peace. These are all synonymous with the God experience, by the way, right? And they found it in the bottle, he said. So when I, when I look back and I, and I lay my own experience along 
what he said, that is true. Because ever since I was a kid, I've been trying to seek the sense of belonging, love, companionship, understanding, you know what I mean? The God experience. But I saw it in things outside of me. I saw it in, uh, I saw that in, in approval of kids on the street, uh, in love of parents, love of extended family members, accolades in school, accolades in sports, job, relationships, money, cars. I saw it. I saw it. But the problem with, with that is that I didn't know about this. I didn't know I had something called the God's high school, that it's insatiable by material things. It's insatiable by your acknowledgement and your love. It's never enough. So what happened with me is I kept on chasing it over and over and over and over and over. And I found it in the bottle. I found it in the bottle. That sense of love and God experience, spiritual experience, I found it in the bottle. And then I chased that in the bottle of bottle after bottom of bottle after bottle after bottle after bottle after suicidal, depressed, broken bank account, broken psyche, slash my wrist. Hospital, mom's broken heart, bottle. Until the disease of alcoholism literally chewed me up and spit me right in front of the gates of insanity and death they talk about. I couldn't, I couldn't live without a drink, and I couldn't drink. I couldn't live with a drink. That jumping off point. And I don't know what happened. Like, like I can tell you in the third dimension, but when I look back, what the only thing that makes sense from where I am today is what at first seemed like a flimsy read. <laughs> was a powerful hand of a, this loving God, loving power, which I don't understand, can't explain, I've only experienced for the last few short years. Caressed me and brought me to you guys. Brought me to the sacred rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, introduced me to some awakened people who introduced me to, the, to a sacred book, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and the 12 steps that are outlined in them. And as a result of the steps, the traditions and the fellowship, all three parts, what happened to me is that literally I woke up. My life has been transformed internally. Like, I wish I could, I wish I could, if you knew, if you knew me back, I wish I could open up my heart and just show you the joy and the peace and love that I feel on most days anyways. Not all the time, right? Most days. I wish I could show you. Words won't do justice. For the next few minutes, few short minutes, I'm just going to try my best. Use my inf finite, finite mind. And my limited language to describe to you that which is indescribable. <laughs> it's got to be experienced, you know? For seven years, I was in and out arguing with the old timers, with the long timers about your relationship with God. If there is a God, what is God? These steps, what part I agree with, which part I don't agree with. <laughs> seven years I did that. <laughs> Can you imagine that? I'm dying. I come to these rooms. Some people are happy. No agenda to save me or change me, just kindness, sharing with me what they did and they drank like me, and I want to argue with them about their solution, dying. See, but I had to do that. Many of us, most of us have to do that. The gift of desperation is not just given freely, it's earned. Gift of desperation that was earned from a lot of pain that I suffered from because I had to knock on every single door to prove to you that I'm not an alcoholic because of this, try everything un under the sun imaginable that I could think of, religions and motivational speakers and sports and girlfriends and books and oh my God, try all that and fail and then come back to you guys. And then I heard what the long timers said. Seven years, the baiting society. I heard what they said. They basically said, Adi, you always believe in a power greater than yourself. It's called alcohol. <laughs> Alcohol dictated the course of your life. All we're going to do, if you want, we're going to introduce you to a new power, to a set of actions, to a new power. So if you're new and if you're struggling with this God idea, I want to I propose something to you. Perhaps you're like me. I wasn't struggling with a God idea. I was struggling with the step one in that I don't think I'm powerless. I think I have enough power in me. I'll figure this thing out. Because the big book so easy. I don't know where it's going this way, but it's going this way. So the big book, so it's so beautiful. It, it, there's a couple of lines that just, just like the last couple of years, it just got magnified for me. I've read it a thousand times. The God, it just says somewhere there, our ideas did not work, but the God idea did. That's it. You don't have to prove the existence of. You don't have to believe anything at all. 
If you're at a place where you believe that your ideas to stay sober and happy have not worked, well, try on the God idea. Just an idea. Check it. This is so beautiful. It's like you can't lower the bar any more than this. Like you can't lower the bar any more than this. You know what I mean? The God idea, okay? So this is the way, this is the way it occurs to me. Anything that I see, like I've been thinking about this, right? It's anything that I see in this world, from this computer to the car outside, to this house, to, to everything, to the, the fruits that are growing in the trees, right? Uh, everything, the planes, there was an idea and somebody said, like the farmer had an idea how to plant certain things and do, right? From an idea. And guess what? Anybody that did anything big, anything that you see around you that was invented, there was an idea in somebody's head without any evidence. And I bet you there was a whole bunch of people saying, you can't do it, impossible. <laughs> right? So the God idea works. And even discussing a power grid in yourself, God, it's just pointless. It doesn't even mean anything. If I'm not at a place of desperation, ready for a different idea. So I got to that place in 2012. Place of desperation, God idea. And what I've done for the last few short years is now gather evidence in my life that God is. I don't need to prove to you and you don't need to prove to me if there is a God. I've gathered evidence in my life that there is a personal, I have ample evidence. There's a personal God in my life, closer to me than breath, because life has thrown me curveballs. I've had to apply the steps and spiritual principles with the help of a sponsor and a group, and it works. I stay sober. I have peace. So the God idea works. I don't care what you call it. <laughs> the God idea works. Simple. See how simple that is? It can't get lower than this. It's beautiful. So the God idea works. I had my first drink at the age of 16. Uh, I was, I'll tell you in a general way, uh, I felt like my skin fit. I felt like, uh, I felt like uh, my mind just shut up, you know? Or I, I, would, I would drink and I remember making plans in my head, like what I'm going to do, uh, what career I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, you know, pursue, how I'm going to uh, help my mom and my dad not fight each other. And he's not going to hit her anymore. And she's not going to cause a chaos. As she I was going to fix everything. And it worked. It was beautiful in my head. Alcohol was a panacea to all my ills, Dr. Bob talks about in his story. Medicine for everything, right? And... I had a huge world of potential. Everyone always used to say, Ali has potential. That's what I used to hear in the periphery, right? Ali has potential. School, uh, pre-med, uh, uh, Olympic Harding game trials, all kinds of stuff. Potential, 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 right? I'm not saying any of this. Who cares? Doesn't mean. I'm just telling you that world of potential, within a few short years, it was this small. I was in a grungy motel room in Southeast Toronto with a bottle of vodka, needles in my arms, all the ugliness that follows that kind of lifestyle, wanting to die every minute of the day. I didn't know what to do with myself. I just wanted to die all the time. I don't know how many suicide attempts. And for those who haven't experienced it yet, for those that perhaps they, have a, they, they may have an idea in their head that suicide is attempts for people that are coward, I beg to differ. You haven't experienced it yet. How dark can you get? You, get, you haven't experienced it yet, perhaps. I don't know how many suicide attempts. And I wasn't planning to do that at the age of 16 when I started. I had no idea until I met you guys that I suffered from an illness of the body, mind, and spirit. I had no idea. I thought, I thought literally, like, the, the many examples of, of times where I would start to drink. I'm back at my parents' house. I would start to drink, right? The drink would be on me, and then the craving kicks in when I drink, right? And I, I need more. I, I need more, right? The drink starts to drink me, right? And, and how many times I would push my mom, kick her in the shoulder, steal her money. I slapped my sister one time. Stole her bank card. Drown her, drain her bank card, drank it all away. It explained what I couldn't otherwise explain. Because it's not that I was heartless or an a-hole, perhaps to some extent. <laughs> it's not that I was stupid or lacking intelligence. I suffer from an allergy of the body. It's an illness in which I, when I take a drink, 
I have no more control of how much I drink. I thought I was deciding to take the next drink till two, three days later. I'm still deciding to take. I have no idea. I have no power control over the decision of taking the drink once I take it. Allergy of the body. Couple that allergy with a mental blank spot, they call it. A another frightening, mind-boggling part of this illness, alcoholism. Allergy of the body, mental obsession. That's it. That's what makes someone an alcoholic, from my understanding, right? I have a mind, I have a brain that has a virus in it. It always tell, tells me a drink is, a, is an option, always. One of these suicide attempts, put razor blades to my wrist, drank a, down the bottle of vodka, stole my dad's Percocets or Tylenol 3s, I think they were at the time. He, he's he, he's an, still active on opiates and opioids, right? Stole his Tylenol 3s, stole some sleeping pills, drank it all down, ended up in an uh, ended up in an uh, emergency room. They gave me some charcoal drink to drink. The next morning, they sent me to the psych ward of the same hospital, ninth or tenth floor. And I'm crying in that appointment with my mom is there and the psychiatrist is there. I'm crying, and she's crying. My mom is bawling her eyes out, man. That lady's broken heart. You have to stop. She was telling me, and I promised her with every fiber of my being, every conviction that I could muster. If you would have hooked up a polygraph test to me, I would have passed it. I, I won't do this to you again. I won't drink. I promise you. I meant it. I think it was two or three days later where they let me out. And this diseased brain with a virus in it, a drink would fix that. That suicide attempt, that's six suicide attempt, just a phase. You need love in your life. You need the right job. A drink would fix that. You could get away with it. Cunning, baffling, and powerful. Step one doesn't say I can't drink or I shouldn't. Nowhere in the big book or in the fellowship that I know of, people say don't drink, you shouldn't. In fact, the big book says if you think you can drink like normal men, our hats are off to you. <laughs> Please go ahead. I wish I could. Right? What step one says that I will drink. I'm guaranteed to drink on my own power. I don't have any choice in the, in the matter. I don't have any choice in the matter. Meanwhile, I'm just dying in this spiritual malady, in this separation from you, in this separation from source. The, the four horsemen are always, uh, I always hear their hopes. There's always some kind of impending doom. I'm always afraid of what you think about me. I can't breathe. I have no oxygen spiritually. The world is heavy. I'm always afraid of, what, of what's going to happen or some resentment from the past. The spiritual malady is so cunning and baffling. That's how it feels. But it's so cunning and baffling that for years it would tell me that I'm an alcoholic because... You're an alcoholic because your dad beat you as a kid. You're an alcoholic because uh, you came from a war zone. You experienced bombing. You're an alcoholic because you came to a new country when you were a kid and you, ex you experienced racism. You're an alcoholic because, 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 because. <laughs> a spiritual malady so cunning and baffling that doesn't want me to look at me. I always have to look at the outside. It always points me to the outside. I think the problem is out there. That's why my entire life, like a chicken with a head cut off, I'm just running around trying to fix the outside. Get the right girlfriend, get the right job, get your approval, look good. <laughs> Not knowing that there's an inside job. My younger sister, how come she's not, she's not an alcoholic? Experienced the same trauma in life as I did. How come she's not one? She's sure she's wounded. You know, as a child, she experienced trauma. She's wounded. Drugs and alcohol hurt her life. When they start to really hurt her life, she put it down. She walked away. And she sought a solution for her wounds in psychiatrists and therapists and motivational speakers and courses and books. It's a beautiful human being. I'm an alcoholic because I like the effect produced by alcohol. That effect for me as an alcoholic it, it fills that God-sized hole to such a degree. It, 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 it heals those wounds to such a degree that I chase it to the gates of insanity and death. Chased it. And I felt broken. 2006. Came to you guys broken. Shattered. Uh, 2006, that was 12 step. Uh, by, a, by a beautiful long time, of walking this path. Practicing principles in his affairs became attractive to me. And I found love with you guys. I found my tribe. It's like we chewed the same dirt. 
a bunch of people that drank like me. That's huge. I got to identify on the, on, on, the, on the drinking. I have to. It's not just sufficient enough for me to identify on the feelings and thoughts. Many people have feelings and thoughts like alcoholics have. It's a human condition. If I don't identify on the drinking, I ain't staying here. I identified on the drinking that other people drank like me. And then the feelings and the thoughts. And you guys never judged me. You were kind to me. You know? He kept on telling me, keep coming back. It's going to be all right. Keep coming back. And I was so happy, man, those first few months. I was sober and just, like, just so happy. Grace of God, you know? Grace of God came in the form of a, they call it a pink cloud. Where I was dying not too long ago, all of a sudden I meet you guys. Just by being around you, I'm happy and I'm sober. And about six months of sobriety, I guess the disease in my and my head woke up and started to continue to tell me that you're not enough. You're not good enough. You're a loser. You're not good enough. I picked up a, and, and then it told me a drink would fix that. I picked up a drink. I was in and out for seven years, as I was saying earlier, seven years dying in this illness, seven years. And I was, and I was, I would come to these rooms, the back of those rooms, and I would be either angry or really depressed because I thought I was doing what you're telling me and I can't stay sober. I don't understand why I was confused at that time, but today I'm not confused. Because I wanted something for nothing. I wanted to operate the same way I was out there, cutting corners and you know doing things my way. I wanted to I wanted to get sober and happy in a twelve step program without working any steps. Basically, how silly that is! Imagine that. Imagine that. Imagine how silly that would be. If in this hypothetical world that I could eat at a, at a restaurant, let's say I could only eat at restaurants, right? How silly it would be if I go to a restaurant 90 times in 90 days, pick up the menu and just read it over and over and over and over, and then go home. Imagine that. I did that in a week. How silly it would be if I go to this restaurant every day, listen to the people that are eating delicious meals, get inspired by their store. Oh, my God, fantastic. And then go home. That's what I did in a week. Just coming to meetings and really active. No steps. <laughs> Imagine that, eh? I missed the boat on the steps. I'm going to fast forward. My last drunk wasn't as bad as the 50 before that. I was renting a room in a men's recovery home. Uh, uh, I, I, again, I was, I was back. I was sober for four months. Uh, late 2011, sober for four months. Busy, really busy in home group and active in the year, setting up chairs and uh, coffee shops and all kinds of stuff in the year, right? Lots of meetings. No steps. I went and drank for a night. I stuck back into that room in that recovery home. Because I had to sneak back in because if I would have told them, I would have been on the streets, right? I passed out and I came to. I came to, and the only way I can describe it was an incredible amount of pain. My skin was throbbing. My, my joints were hurting. My mind was racing. And I heard the four horsemen, bewilderment, terror, whatever they say in the big book. I heard them again. I heard their hooves, and they came like this in these two thoughts. Why don't you kill yourself? You're never going to amount to anything. Why don't you take a drink? And I don't know what happened that time that was different from the hundreds before. All I know is that my knees got bent, hit that wooden floor, and I prayed. I cried a prayer from the depths of my soul, something like this. God, wherever you are, whoever you are, can you just please help me not be like this anymore? I just don't want to be like this anymore. Whatever this is, I can't do another 24 of this. Don't want to be like this anymore. Can you help me? After that prayer, I'm still in a lot of pain, but I didn't want to kill myself. I didn't want to drink anymore. That was my how, how dark it is before the dawn moment. If it's dark for you today, man, dawn's just around the corner. Don't give up. How dark it, I wanted to kill myself. I take a drink, and I prayed. And all of a sudden, I see the light. Metaphorically speaking, I see the light. And it came in the form of an idea. Go back to AA. <laughs> Go and look for those loving people. Just listen to them this time. And God caressed me, brought me back to you guys. I put a new teacher in my path. And this teacher opened the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous with me. We started to go through it line by line. Just the way it worked for me. Literally, we, walked, we opened it from the preface, line by line, black on the white. We were read. If it said to identify with something, I would identify if I could. If it says to take an action, I would. this monster wouldn't move forward until that action was taken. That's how I was taken through the steps in the big book, as outlined in the big book. 
And I can tell you that I started to wake up, I started to breathe, I started to be able to identify what it means to be an alcoholic and that I, that I am one, you know what I mean? Because I knew what it was to be an alcoholic. Seven years in and out, I understood. Physical allergy, mental obsession, that's it. That's what makes an alcoholic, right? But now, seven years of a beating, try my ideas, I was humbled and I got to pour my experience on the page of this book and it became alive to me as my sponsor did the same thing. And I started to see Bill Wilson. I started to believe him, a man that lived decades in the past and couldn't be further in likeness from who I, who I was at that time and who I am today. Yet I was able to identify myself with him. He's an alcoholic and so am I. And so was the sponsor sitting across the table and so all these elders in the meetings that maybe this program can work for me too. That may, maybe they're telling the truth because what else do I have to lose? So we set on the course of vigorous action to the best of my ability. We started to go through the inventory process and the house cleaning steps. And I, and I woke up for a period of time, I was unplugged from the ego. And I got to see that everything that I'm complaining about in my life externally, you guys and government and parents and whatever I'm complaining about has one, one common denominator, that's me. I saw that it was me. I woke up and I had a powerful experience in my steps. First round of steps, six and seven, powerful God experience, man. Right? Sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. Always materializes if we work hard. And went through the immense process. With every single amends, I could tell you that I got a piece of my soul back. Like I would, I, 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 this disease got me fast and early, right? I never got a chance to build anything financially speaking. It wasn't my story. I was just a loser my whole entire life. I always tried, I would drink it away, right? So I, I had a lot of financial difficulties, a lot of fears around me. As I would make more financial amends, $5 a month, $2 here, went to the best of my ability. All of a sudden, two things would happen. Either financial abundance would come at, at me when I needed it, or I would stop being afraid of not having it. Isn't that beautiful? As I start to make amends uh, and try to, try to heal some of the wounds of the people that I've hurt, love would come into my life. My entire life, my entire life, I thought I need self-esteem. This personal uh, self-help stuff, Beautiful, just hasn't worked for me because all of them, they require me to do for me. It's about me, right? My entire life, I thought I'm going to dress up this monkey, go, uh, uh, go to the gym, put on some weight, get a nice car, get a nice girlfriend, put on ni nice clothes, and, and I'm going to feel okay. Do you know why? Because you're going to tell me, hey, Ali, you're okay, man, <laughs> depending on your approval, right? Imagine that. But what you told me, Ali, in this program, it works the other way. Bill Wilson says, uh, the, the spiritual level, it said common sense becomes uncommon sense. So my common sense that I get self-esteem by doing for me first, eh, doesn't work. I drink that way. Uncommon sense. I get self-esteem by doing for you first. And the first set of the steps, my, my experience, my opinion. So if yours differs, that's okay. That I get to start to do for other people, really, at a deep level, is the immense process. I get to start right the wrongs I did. And you know that father that I told you, I alluded to, he used to hit us, he used to beat us, he used to hit my mom. The chaos and the violence and the terror of the addiction, active addiction, him and I are best friends today. I fell in love with that man. Because I saw through my, I, I became free through, my, through, my, through the steps. I became free of the ideas I had about for whatever reason, I had these facts before, but I start to see them. I start to see and become present to the fact that this man was kicked out at the age of 14 or 13, the kid. Made his way on the streets. You know what I mean? He became a well-to-do person. Raised a family, got married, got a couple of kids. I saw that he always had, he always, uh, Whatever he had, he gave. He always had my back financially. He just didn't have what was not given to him. I saw that. I wanted for years from him to give me things that were not given to him. He didn't have to give to me. He grew up in an addicted home. Imagine how silly, insane that is. If I have a, if I, let's say, walk by a homeless person on the street, every single day, I demand $100 from this person. He doesn't have it. He throws a penny at me. He swears at me because he's drunk and he's hurting. 
And then every day I walk by him and I, you effing, effing, I can't believe you're not giving me a hundred dollars and I carry it for 30 years. <laughs> I did that with my dad. I'm not trying to demean my dad. It's just an analogy, right? He just didn't have. <laughs> he gave me what he had though. I saw that. You know what else I saw? I saw that this man in active addiction at the age of 40, okay? There was bombing in Iran. We left Iran in 1986 because there were bombing. The bombing wasn't that bad. We could have easily moved to another city where there wasn't bombing, right? He, he left accolades, a good paying job, acknowledgement. Everybody knew him. A good life. He picked us up. He left all of that behind. He picked us up like lion cubs, brought us all the way across the ocean to a new country. He looks different than everybody there, especially at that time, 36 years ago. Doesn't speak a word of English. And for the first year, in order to... Uh, Sort of not make ends meet. He we had money. We brought money, but he he didn't know. He didn't want to, you know, just spend everything and not do anything. For the first year, he mopped the pizza pizza floor, man. Crying every night. Could you do that? I asked myself, could you do that? You know what kind of love and sacrifice it takes? I had to see. And I'm judging him on his addictions. I'm still trying to blame every failure in my life at the age of 35, whatever it was when I, I had my last drink. So what happened to me as a kid? I made an amends to that man. We became free. And a few months ago, at the age of 75, because he saw the walk of Alcoholics Anonymous, because he saw God shining through, because of what you keep teaching me. He has a conversation with me. And I'm translating. He said, son, I want to thank you the way you are with me. I'm losing my hear." He said, I'm losing my hearing. And, I, and I'm losing my memory. Sometimes I don't even know your name. But when I talk to you, you make me feel like there's hope and everything is going to be okay. I want to thank you for the way you are with me. Can you do me a favor? Can you talk to me about the sobriety thing a little? That's a power of God, the God idea. You can't tell me there isn't a God. I have experienced in my own life that the God idea, this path works. I don't care what you call it. <laughs> I don't care what you call it. That this path works, you know? And, and, and the last few years, man, no, before I get to that, I want to share a couple of things that I always share because I think it's important. It's just my experience, right? It may not be of the norm these days, but it's just my experience, okay? So I said to sponsor, as in like, I was on step 12 and show someone else how the 12 steps work, how to apply them, that, you know, at, the, at three and a half months of sobriety. I was sponsoring people at three and a half months of sobriety. I don't want to do that, though. I was scared. When my elders and my sponsor with decades of sobriety suggested to me that you better try to pass this message on, I would sort of argue with them not too long though i just argue with them right because i was scared and what they would tell me is that Ali, it's none of your business kindly and sternly sometimes right it's none of your business to whom and how and when you pass this message on when you're at step 12 you pray and you make yourself available the rest is up to god you may not stay sober if you don't try to pass this message on so i would pray in the mornings god if it's your will, can you please something like this? Can you please put a sponsor in my path? Because I don't want to drink and die anymore, you know? I really like this last few months, what's been happening. So God has infinite mercy. I, ha I ended up uh, chairing a, a meeting at a men's shelter in downtown Toronto. I think the person who was chairing went out or went on vacation, and my sponsor said, go. And I go. Like, I, I take direction. I just take direction. Well, my sponsor says, do something. I'd have to understand it. I just do it. I get the results after, right? It's just been my experience. So. I went and I would open the big book and read three pages from the big book. And then these men would, uh, uh, they start to trust me. They would, they would share from the broken places where they were, from the pain. And they're in a the shelter. You know what I mean? They can't stay sober, right? And, uh, and I would share, share that, hey, four months ago I was drinking and I'm not. I've been sober four months, five months. I, I wanted to kill myself every day. I don't. <laughs> you know, I'm happy most of the time. They start to trust me. They start to trust the tangibility. I hope that's the word. Tangibility of my time in recovery. Because sometimes when you're new, like decades in sobriety seems like a universal way, you know? 
And then they would come to me after the meeting and say, Ali, can you just help us do whatever it is that's happened to you with these 12 steps you talk about? I said, okay, sure, no problem. So I would open the big book <laughs> and we'll go through line by line, right? And I got to tell you, I don't know if any of those men are sober today. Those first set of gifts, don't know if they're sober today. But I haven't had a drink since. I stayed sober. This beautiful program, this language of love, the love that I was chasing in outside things and eventually found it in the drink, but the drink turned on me. This language of love started 87 plus years ago because Bill Wilson needed to stay sober himself in the Mayflower Hotel. He didn't look for another alcoholic that happened to be Dr. Bob with an agenda to keep him sober. He was going to drink. He needed another alcoholic to stay sober himself. That's how the language of love started. And I did the best that I could, you know? And I like to think I'm a better sponsor today. I got more life experience, applying spiritual principles, but I did the best I could, you know? I did the best I could. And I believe I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't, uh, l l like it says in the big book, uh, uh, you know, what does Bill Wilson say? We wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't uh, survive the trials and tribulations of life if it wasn't for trying to talk to other alcoholics, trying to help them, right? I believe it's the same for me. The last few short years, man, life's been on, in session. It's throwing curveballs at us, boulders at us, and my wife and I. We've had cancers to deal with and deaths in the family. My depression, ever since I was a kid, depression coming for a visit, I had to get outside help with the 12 steps. Thank God it's transformed. But once in a while, it still comes for a little visit. <laughs> you know? Uh, business failure after business failure after business failure. In recovery. Can't find a job to help support a family. In recovery or find jobs, can't support a family, they don't pay enough. And all the negative thinking that the isms of alcoholism play in an alcoholic's head. You're not good enough, you're a loser. You, why, how are you a dad? How are you a husband? My wife and I got separated for a while. All those things in life, I wouldn't survive them if, it, if I wasn't trying to help other alcoholics stay sober <laughs> or pass this message on. I wouldn't be sober. One thing ensures immunity from alcohol, al drinking alcohol. One thing. Everything else will fail at some point or another. One thing that's trying to pass this message on to another alcoholic. You know? And I got to tell you, with all these calamities in life that have happened, I'm so grateful for them. I like to share them because they've given me power. They've given me a new and deeper experience with this loving power. Because what I have had to do through the pain, through the valleys in life, in recovery and sobriety, is come back with my tail between my legs, come back to the table with God. To get rid of my ideas. All these painful valleys have made me more humble and kinder. They made me a better human being, you know? And I'm so grateful for the teachers that are around me, including my sponsor, Butch. Man, I love that man. What a beautiful man he is. Every time I go to them, with anything, they allow me to share, and then they share their experience if they've had it, applying spiritual principles, then they point me to God. They point me to some kind of action that points me to God. They point me to some kind of inventory, some kind of prayer and meditation, some kind of amend, some kind of uh, something, action, that points me to a deeper experience with this power because I'm beyond human health, and they know that. They know that. I love your love. I cherish your love. I seek your love. It's not sufficient by itself to keep me sober. If your love motivates me to seek on a deeper level, that's a beautiful thing. But by itself, it's not sufficient. I've had love in my life. Female love, uh, forget about that. The most of it is because I don't even know how to love. Usually that kind of love for me is infatuation or hostage taking. So forget about that. Parents love, <laughs> my mom's love. <laughs> not enough. Not enough, you know? And I was told that the only, this program works only in this way and this order. The, the spiritual remedy, malady, must be remedied first and then the physical and mental follow. It is not the other way around. It's not the other way around, man. I don't suffer from a drinking problem. If, if, if anyone suffers a drinking problem, the solution is put it down and walk away. I suffer from a drinking solution. I don't know how to live life. Drink is a solution that turned on me, that stopped working. I suffer from alcoholism.
It's a soul sickness. It's a spiritual malady in which on my own power, I want to crawl out on my own skin. On my own power, I'm always worried about what you think about me, man. I'm so sick of it. It's tiring. <laughs> but I don't live like that anymore most of the time. You know how freeing that is? I need a relationship with God. I need a loving relationship with this power. The God idea, right? And I got to tell you, the first, the first, uh, first couple of years, I was sponsoring a lot of men, speaking here and there, really attached. The ego had like, you know, grown in, in the background. I had no idea, right? I never see it. I can see yours. I can't see mine. That's why I need a sponsor to see me, right? So, and, and I started to get attached. The number of sponsors, what they're doing, what I sound like, that, 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 that image in alcoholics and an image out there, right? Let's get attached. I would come to these rooms and I would lie to you that the relationship with God is the most important relationship in my life. And I was lying to you, but I didn't know the depths of my life. And the kind old timers, the kind long timers also knew that I didn't know that I was lying. So a messenger pulled me aside kindly, quietly, not in front of people to embarrass me. I had a relationship with this person. Ali, what other relationship is important in your life? My wife. Okay. So I want you to consider this. If you give your wife on a daily basis, the amount of time that you give this God, your wife would divorce you. You wouldn't have a relationship. I was caught red-handed. I didn't know because I was still doing that two years and change in what I was doing when I first came in. Quick little prayer at night, quick little prayer in the shower, and that's it. No relationship. You know what I mean? And I woke up from that day to this. I built a prayer life, a meditation life. I wake up early in the morning. I spend time with this power. I worship God, man. I worship this power. Throughout the day, I'm always praying for God to, I'm not running the show. God, remove the selfish stairs. Show me what you want me to do. What's the next step? How can I be upset? Always. If someone watched me with a kid in camera, they would think I'm crazy. Always praying. <laughs> And if there's a lot of people around, I'm praying inside, you know. <laughs> At night, I do a little thing. I built, a, I cultivated a relationship with this power. As a result of spending time, I've, I've developed and deepened a relationship with a loving power personal to me. Personal to me. And words don't do justice when I describe to you the, the love and peace and serenity that I feel on most days. And also on the flip side of that, what I already described a little bit, Words can't do justice when, listen, if God is there when I'm happy and joyous and free, when I'm getting what I want, then God better be there in those fetal position fear moments because I've had those in recovery. God better be there there too. I don't know who said fear and faith can't exist in the same space. They better for me. <laughs> they better for me. Right? A loving God carried us through all the pain. Loving God, man. I'll share this with you. Just quickly, like, as a result of prayer and meditation and building a relationship with life, with God, uh, and with the present moment, what, what has happened to me is that, unbeknownst to me, as I watch it, I've become a servant. As I watch it, you know? I get to go, I get in the, I, I go in the darkness to see and the silence to hear. I'll just give you one example. This so many examples, right? Just a little, uh, just a little trail of my career path, right? In recovery, I couldn't find a job to help support my wife. And you know, sometimes two alcoholics under the same roof. If when we both fall asleep spiritually, the the fighting that goes, the discussion argument around finances, everybody has them sometimes, right? In prayer and meditation, it came that. You got to go, it can't, when I tell you I hear things, I hear things, not audibly, but every cell in my body hears it. Like, I know this is it. And I follow the spiritual where it comes. You got to go volunteer, volunteer somewhere, pray, meditate, sit with it, write on it. Where? Some kind of 12-step based treatment center, literally. So I go to a 12-step based treatment center, right? I want to volunteer. They have a whole bunch of stranger rules why I can't because I don't qualify even for a volunteer. Check that out. I want to do it for free. So, so, so I sat there, right? I'm with the manager in this office, and I'm just pouring my heart. I'm just honest. Okay, no problem, right? All of a sudden, nobody knew that I was going to be there. I had no idea these people worked there. Three of their top counselors, members of Alcoholics Anonymous, also counseled decades in sobriety, one by one, 
literally walk into that office. They had no idea what was there. Knock on the door. They would never bother this person, the manager, if, unless it's an emergency, right? Oh, there's something important I have to talk to you with. Oh, Ali, what are you, what are you doing here? Oh, my God, I know. Each of them, one by one, 30 seconds after the other, giving me hugs. Oh, my God, he's such a great guy, Kevin. Oh, my, you don't understand. I hope you get this guy to come. Listen, I'm not a great guy. What they're talking about, Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's what they're talking about, right? On my own power, I'm, I'm nobody, right? All of a sudden, this manager, his jaw drops, and he's like, I guess you're staying here, eh? Well, I guess so, right? So within a few short months, he comes and he offers me a job. But so-and-so, I, I don't have the accreditations. You need to go to school. I don't care. I've seen enough. So I was doing big book workshops, just the first three steps. You know what I mean? Stuff like that and different things I was learning. I was barely making enough money to make ends meet. But, you know, it was satisfying and fulfilling. And I was shown that you got to be a servant. I'll take care of the rest of your life. Ended up in this career path. Ended up in a, 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 maybe this was before this situation, but I'm not sure. But somewhere along the line, I'm working for a sponsor. This, this policy has a, a fencing company building fences around houses, digging to something called clam shovels. You got to dig the ground three, four feet of grass. It's hard sometimes, man. Six hours, eight hours digging, hot, tears in my eyes, pissed off, cursing God. Man, what? Come on, man, help me out here. <laughs> I'm doing what you want. All of a sudden, I pause. I go into silence to hear. I pause and I pray, God, remove the self centeredness remove the selfishness from me. Show me who would you have me be and what would you have me do, God? All of a sudden, I hear the 65-year-old man that was sitting a few minutes before me for a break who was hustling just like me. 65-year-old, he, he lost a deck business to a messy divorce. So he had to be a laborer like me. I hear him start to talk about Ali. I want to share something with you. You've told me that you don't drink. And listen. I've been wanting to kill myself the last two weeks and I can't stop drinking, man. Can you help me? And I still talk to him. <laughs> you can't tell me there isn't. Anything. I start to talk to him about the power of alcoholic silence, how bad it was for me and what happened in my life. And what a beautiful, check this out. The same situation, the same crappy job with little money, all of a sudden I have a shift in outlook in life. That's called the spiritual experience where I love this job. <laughs> where I, all the have-tos in my life become get-tos. I get to come to work. I get to look for a job. That man is sober today. I've had so many of these. God finally put me in, in a career path a few months ago that I love. I've never had a job that I wanted to wake up to, that I get to support my family in a more meaningful way. And even in this job, there's not enough time. He keeps showing me, you want to get to know me? You got to get to know my kids. I made a deal way back in the third step. It's not about growing a bank account, not about looking good, not about being happy. No, happiness is a, it, 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 my ego uses it as, a, as an attachment, as bondage. I need to be happy all the time. No, this is about being, for me, a servant, useful, a meaningful life of being a servant. He keeps teaching me. He keeps showing me. And the last few years, I've had the most incredible life experiences. All those things, material stuff, I have them. Not overly, just enough, you know. But they don't keep me sober. They don't have the power to keep me sober. Beautiful wife, back in love together, coming up to nine years marriage. When I say beautiful, I mean on the inside and outside, right? And the inside is more important. Suicide attempt after suicide attempt. Didn't know what to do with this, with, with this life. God gave us a baby boy seven years ago, and he's the best thing in my life. He's the best thing in my life, Darius. I never knew a love like this, and I get to experience it now. I get to experience it now. If you're new, if you're newly back, I pray that you get the gift of desperation, whatever that looks like for you, that you can set aside everything that you think you know. I had to do that because I knew a lot. <laughs> right? And join a home group, get a sponsor, dive in these steps, dive in this path. Notice that word dive. You don't have to. I'm sharing my experience. I so, and so long as I was wiggling my toes, I wasn't getting results. I had to dive. That's just for me. Maybe that's the way for you. Right? Dive in this world. And you will be able to participate in this beautiful love story that I've, been able to, that I've been taking part in the last few short years. This big book is a love story. Remember my search for love early on, for that love and peace? The big book introduced me to that. And what it told me that, Ali, you've always been present to love. 
You've always been present to God. It's just there's been things inside you that's been blocking you. And the beautiful thing about this program, and I'll finish, the beautiful thing about this beautiful path is that the only way for me to participate in this love story, I got to walk with you. Can't do it alone. I got to take loving actions towards you. That's how I get to love myself. That's how I get to bring love into my marriage, bring love into my relationship with my son, bring love into my relationship with my sponsees and with my home group. And I make mistakes all the time. Bring love at the cashier at the Tim Hortons when she gets my order wrong. And I say, thank you very much. And I draw it anyways. It's a love story, man. Please don't sell yourself short. This program for me has never been about relief. It's about freedom. God bless you. Thank you very much.